All right, well, welcome back, everybody. We'll get started with our next session. And, and <coughs> excuse me, goodness, when we talked about um, how we were going to set up this and what the idea, again, we were going to talk about the process is, you know, we realize that there is a large number of stakeholders in this process and what we do. And each of those stakeholders come in with a completely different perspective about what's important to them and how they're going to go about, you know, measuring what criteria are we going to set up and what is our end goal. And so the idea was, was to bring all of these different stakeholders in, as many as possible, to kind of just talk about their perspective on the idea of performance standards, because it is. It is not a one-size-fits-all. And we are all going to come into this with different preconceived ideas. And so we are starting off with the, the group that is not necessarily the ones that would be necessarily implementing performance standards, but the group that would either be advising or overseeing the outcome. And that is the regulatory or advisory types um, of groups. And so we're going to start with those folks. And I really, this has been a learning process as the, as the co-chair of this, and I have learned an immense amount about this. And one of them, things that I learned is the difficult position that these stakeholders are in. And I had a conversation with, with Susan Silk not too long ago about how difficult it is for both the regulatory or advisory groups on approaching this, and that we as the end users oftentimes view them as, you know, the regulations of overburdensome. And, you know, I think the idea of the eighth version of the guide was, was to try and scale that back. And that was the idea behind the performance standards. And so they're caught in, I know, like Pat alluded to, we just want Ola to tell us what to do. I mean, a lot of times that's, we're afraid to go out on our own. So we just want them to tell us what to do. But on the other side, we're saying, you guys are, are coming down on us too hard, or you're telling us to do you know, too much that we're supposed to do. Let us do it our own way. That's a difficult position to be in. And, and so I appreciate that they've come to talk to us about um, how they, they view performance standards, how they, would, how they approach them, and how they want to help us as the end users in this whole process. So we're going to start out. Um, Ms. Susan Silk is the Director of the Division of Policy and Education at the Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare. Um, I've had the pleasure to work with Susan as a roundtable committee member um, for almost a year, a little over a year now, actually, and um, have really appreciated her input. So we're going to start off with Susan. Hi, everyone. Do, do I have this mic in the right place? Can you hear me? Um, I'm going to talk about some history, too. Um, I'm not nearly old enough to talk about history, but <laughs> I'm not as old as Catherine and Pat. The gray hairs are disguised. Um, but um, I think the history is important for understanding NIH's perspective. Uh, we have a long history at NIH of supporting per, uh, performance standards. Um, as you know, uh, we at OLA oversee the welfare of research animals according to the standards of the PHS policy. The PHS policy was first published in 1985. It incorporated the sixth edition of the guide um, by reference. That connection continues today. And here we see uh, the eighth edition of the guide is incorporated to the new 2015 guide by reference. Have you seen this new version of the guide? Good, that means our distribution system's working. Um, incorporation by reference is a tool that enables federal agencies to give legal effect to materials that have been published elsewhere. This is allowed under a provision of the Freedom of Information Act that requires agencies uh, to publish regulations in the Federal Register. Federal law and policy um, require federate, 
federal agencies to use these standards by reference uh, instead of creating government unique technical standards to purely serve regulatory purposes. And so because the guide provides the best standards, best practice standards for biomedical animal care and use programs, the PHS policy requires assured institutions to base their programs on the guide. One of Ola's jobs is to interpret the guide, and so I will interpret that phrase, base their programs on, for you now. It means that the guide is a starting point. It's a guide as to how to operate a quality program. The PHS system of oversight is different from the inspection-based system used uh, by some of our colleagues. And that is because NIH is a scientific organization, not a regulatory agency. Our objective is to provide humane treatment of animal research subjects in the service of robust scientific research. PHS oversight is based on uh, self-monitoring and self-regulation. Self-reporting, self-regulation was the old term. Self-monitoring and self-reporting systems draw everyone in the animal programs into responsibility and accountability for humane animal care and use. It's grassroots oversight, if you will. This supports the development of a culture of compliance. Some people like to call that a culture of caring. Uh, that is 360 degrees, 24-7. 1985 was a big year in animal welfare. That was during the Reagan administration. Time goes so fast, I had to look this up. Um, in 1985, the 99th Congress was in session with George Bush as the president of the Senate, which had a Republican majority. Um, Bob Dole was the majority leader. Tip O'Neill was the Speaker of the House, which had a Democratic majority. No matter what our politics are today, we owe a debt of gratitude to the 99th Congress because they worked together and authorized the laws and policies that are our foundations today. The US government principles for the utilization and care of vertebrate animals used in testing, research, and training were promulgated in 1985. The Animal Welfare Act was amended. The PHS policy was written and the Health Research Extension Act, which authorizes, that means provides the funding for, NIH was passed. There was a report that accompanied the Health Research Extension Act of 1985, and it said, it is far better to place primary responsibility for assuring compliance with NIH guidelines on committees within institutions rather than relying on intrusive federal inspections. So you see, NIH and my office, OLA, have the support of Congress in our reliance on IACUCs, those in-house committees that oversee PHS-funded act animal activities. They are our feet on the ground. The 1985 Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals, uh, the sixth edition, specified that the proper care and humane treatment of animals requires scientific and professional judgment, which is based on knowledge of the husbandry needs of each species and the special requirements of research, testing, and educational programs. And here is the description of performance standards in the current guide. And in, in, here we are in, 19, in uh, 19, 2015. Performance standards provide flexibility in achieving outcome by granting discretion to those responsible. The performance approach requires professional judgment professional input, sound judgment, and a team approach. 
you can see that these standards are solidly derived from the ideas in the 85 guide. This evolution occurred because of 26 years of cooperation and careful work supported by documentation and information sharing within our community. Here's an example of that cooperation and communication. In 1997, after the release of the seventh edition, the 1996 edition of the guide, um, the uh, Center, uh, Scientist Center for Animal Welfare, SCAL, held a symposium on performance standards in animal welfare. Does that sound familiar? It seemed to me like um, a mirror of what we're doing today. Um, anyway, this, um, uh, they published a summary uh, of their meeting, and the summary was called Performance Standards in Animal Welfare, Definition, Application, Assessments, Part 1 and 2. Um, in the document, they say the goal of the conference was to figure out how to translate theoretical performance standards into practical guidelines that could be implemented for the care and use of many species. I think that's what we're doing here today, again, still. Um, they went on to say that after performance standards have been defined, different, different applications and methods of assessment need to be developed. We are still involved in this process today. Uh, this slide shows a letter from Stephen Barthold who was chair of the ILAR Council in 2007, to Maggie Snyder of NIH. Uh, Maggie was the NIH official responsible for our portion of the contract to update the 1996 guide, the seventh edition. Prior to this time, NIH had solicited public input and conducted a study to determine whether it was necessary to update the guide. NIH determined that although it would be okay to update the guide, it was not necessary. In this letter, Dr. Barthold wrote on behalf of uh, Joanne Zerlo, who was the director of ILAR at that time, to advise NIH that the ILAR Council had determined uh, that it would be necessary to update the guide. He specifically mentions that ILAR Council members pointed out the necessity of preserving and perhaps even increasing the performance-based nature of this document. Oh, whoops. Um, I'll just mention here that NIH is one of a number of organizations that contributed to, that means funded, uh, the effort to update the guide. The work was done under the supervision of ILAR, and the guide was published by the National Research Council of the National Academies. Sometimes people incorrectly call the guide the NIH guide because of the close association between the PHS policy and the guide, which I explained to you earlier as incorporation by reference. When I hear this, I always correct them because I think it's important for our community to understand that the guide is not an operations document imposed upon them by the NIH but rather a collection of wisdom of experts under the benevolent leadership of the National Academy and ILAR, led by LIDA, which serves the interest of nonpartisan scientific integrity. In any case, the decision was made to update the guide. NIH and many other organizations made contributions to support the update. This slide provides a quote from the statement of task to the expert panel responsible for the update. The panel operated under the following instructions where scientifically warranted the guidance and recommendations of the 1996 guide will be changed to reflect new scientific evidence while maintaining the performance standards of the 96 guide. So at last I come to the uh, purpose of my talk. Uh, with all that historical preparation. Um, it took a long time to select a panel of experts at the academies and to verify that they were professionally and ethically appropriate to update the guide. And then there was the work itself, 
which required time, time to seek and consider the public input, time to review the literature, and time to draft the document. NIH was sequestered well away from the process to preserve the independence of the expert panel. And so OLA got its first look at the new guide, the 2011 guide, eighth edition, in December of 2010, along with the rest of the community. The guide's official publication date is 2011. And then NIH took about a year to adopt the guide. We too solicited public input. Um, we analyzed that input and released our decision to adopt the eighth edition of the guide. The following slides are some of the text that accompanied the rollout of our decision, the decision to require PHS assured institutions to implement the new guide. Ola, speaking for the NIH director and the Public Health Service said, performance standards are the most important component of the infrastructure of PHS oversight of animal programs at assured institutions. At Dave, as Dave alluded to earlier, he and I had a conversation about this. And he suggested that one of the problems that organizations face in implementing performance standards is that they're unclear about whether federal agencies support the use of performance standards. So I want to clear up that misunderstanding here. Performance standards are the most important component of the infrastructure of PHS oversight of animal programs. OLA stands behind this statement. We expect IACUCs to meet their responsibility to ensure humane animal care and use while advancing quality scientific research through the use of performance standards in the IACUCs uh, oversight of institutional animal programs. So you can find this statement and the ones that follow at, uh, at, this, um, where's this thing? at this URL on the OLA website. If you have trouble finding it, call me and I'll click through it with you. Um, this is how we expect assured institutions to do this, to implement performance standards. Through the cooperative application of diverse expertise to develop outcome-based performance standards that enhance the quality of animal care and use programs. OLA expects assured institutions to apply appropriate professional judgment and experience to the challenges inherent in developing policies and procedures to maintain a quality program that provides humane care to animals. Furthermore, since the standards of the guide and the guide itself support performance standards that came from within the communities. These are the standards that were already in use by 2011 at most programs when the guide was relieved, released. Therefore, OLA expected minimal change to quality programs as they adopted the new guide. Institutions that were not currently meeting those standards were given a year to develop a reasonable plan and schedule for implementation of the guide. Um, and, and, and Pat stole my thunder on this, but we took um, the text from the guide, and we know that um, some of you don't like to read a lot of lengthy text. We tried to condense the expectation into the guide, uh, the expectations in the guide for performance standards into our own succinct statement of those. And because Pat quoted them, I think we were successful. So um, we expect performance standards to make for good science and well cared for animals. The goal of this performance standard must be identified, and there must be metrics to assess if the criteria are being met. Simple 
clear, I hope, um, perhaps challenging to apply, but, but you know what the standards are that OLA expects. We put our position statements on the OLA website in December of 2011, and we updated these statements in response to public comments and questions in May of 2012. That's just so you can get your place in the history of all this. Um, when I analyzed our public comments, um, there were certain uh, key issues that um, were confusing to the community, um, that caused anguish in the community. And so um, we prepared a series of webinars to help the community understand um, our expectations. You can find these URLs at this webinar showed down here. Um, and we try to make the webinars convenient for all types of learners. You can join us and listen to these webinars in real time if you like to, or you can listen to a recorded version that we uh, put up on our website after the webinar. Um, we also have closed caption on the webinars as they're being rolled out in real time, and that is included in the recorded version. We type up a transcript of the webinar, and we provide PDF of slides used during the webinar. We keep, uh, although we all, always welcome questions from you, we keep a special uh, bucket, I think of it as a bucket, open for about two weeks after a webinar, and we entertain questions on uh, the, that topic, the topic of the webinar, for about two weeks. And then the speakers in the webinar and OLA staff prepare answers to those questions, and we, um, we put those um, in uh, an, amend an addendum to the transcript, so that's available to all of you. Give you a couple weeks to, to think this over and react. And uh, uh, my colleague, Nicole Zimmerman, who's in the office, is in the uh, audience, is preparing a way to index those questions into OLA's topic index to make them more accessible uh, to you. So, so look for that. Um, anyway, um, there were certain issues uh, of, of great concern. And it seemed to me that the meta issue underlying those concerns was um, a, an understanding of performance standards. So I asked uh, Jan Garber, and she agreed. Um, I remember that um, Thanksgiving weekend, we were on the telephone uh, working on this webinar. Um, J uh, Jan, as, as Pat mentioned to you, was the chair of the guide expert panel. And so to my mind, she was the perfect person to help us develop a webinar on implementing performance standards. She was also involved in the, um, the 1997 SCAW conference and had a historical perspective. I think it's a terrific webinar, and I encourage you to access that free resource. Um, we also uh, tried to address other uh, important issues, and Guy uh, Muldar is in the audience today. He and Joe Gannon did a terrific uh, webinar about the, the single issue that generated the most questions for us, and that was rodent housing. So um, as I think I mentioned, the, um, the position statements, which we put out in 2011 and revised in May of 20, uh, 2012, are no longer front and center on our website. However, these FAQs, which extracted language, uh, they're not front and center, but they're available in our legacy area, our archive. And, and so we extracted language from those and put, um, put these in the FAQs for your continued use. So um, I'm not going to discuss each one in detail. I think I'm out of time. And, um, but let me remind you what these are and tell you that go, go to these if you need them, read them, use them. If you have questions, call us. We like to get phone calls from you, and we're happy to help you with any questions that you have. So um, the, the first one is about um, rodent housing. 
We reinforce our support of the guide. We tell you that you need to assess the adequacy of housing and suggest some parameters for doing that. These are all very closely linked to the guide. We, um, we comment on um, the, the cages in use today. That was an issue of concern. And we give some standards for assessing the health of the animals. And then we tell you that it's OK to make a blanket-wide um, policy that applies at your institution. And we tell you the standards that we expect. And then we go on to another FAQ that asks about may performance standards determine housing issues? Our answer is yes. We give you some parameters for doing that. May performance standards determine environmental issues? Yes, they may. We suggest ways to do that. And the rabbit cage housing controversy. So we address that with some details of how you can apply that at your own programs. And I'd be glad to take any questions that you have when the panel convenes. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I appreciate that starting off this session. Our next speaker is Carol Clark. Dr. Clark is a veterinarian with the um, USDA um, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, where she is a research program manager um, here in, uh, or just across over in Maryland. So Dr. Clark is going to give the USDA Sorry. perspective. Carol. OK. OK. All right, so everyone can hear me. Well, good morning. I'm going to talk about the Animal Welfare Act regulations and its approach to humane animal care. Uh, first of all, uh, the Animal Welfare Act regulations uh, is a mixture of performance and engineering standards. And even though um, those terms are not part of the language of the regulations, there is an element of both because there's more than one way to achieve animal welfare goals. For example, let's talk about the IACUC. Uh, you know, in our regs, it says the IACUC is to review at least once every six months the program's animal care and use, and also inspect at least once every six months all of the animal facilities. That's very prescriptive. There are no special circumstances. It is what it is every six months. That's an engineering approach. However, if you read further down in the regulations, it says the IACUC determines the best means of conducting evaluations of the research facilities programs uh, and its facility. Um, of course, there's no exclusion of a committee member. Uh, it's OK to form subcommittees. And you can use consultants to assist. So here, this is very flexible. The defined goal is to get those inspections done. There's a team approach. So here, this is a performance approach. Another example, when we talk about uh, housing, um, this happens to be a chart for hamsters, the minimum sports place requirements. Um, this is very prescriptive. So this is an engineering approach. But you, if you read further down in the regulations, we also talk about innovative primary enclosures. As you remember, they do not meet the space requirements, but provide sufficient volume of space and opportunity to provide species-specific behavior. This is very flexible. So this is an example of a performance approach. So I want to just point out two important phrases that you'll see throughout our regulations. One will say, in accordance with established veterinary and medical practices. And then you might also see a phrase that says, currently accepted professional standards. I bring this up because standards and practices evolve. As you, or some of you might recall, in the 1980s, post-operative pain medication was not routinely given. Now it's a required veterinary practice. And as, you, as some of you recall, the early programs to promote psychological well-being of non-human primates kind of centered around toys. Now it's moved beyond that. We're talking about innovative housing. We're having more grouping. And there's a lot of behavioral monitoring. So why is this all important about this evolution? Because what constitutes compliance can change as a result of the evolution of standards and professionally accepted practices over time. So now we get to the interactive part, myth or reality. 
So who's going to be the unicorn and who's going to be the norwal or the norwhale, however you pronounce it? The Animal Welfare Act regulations are based on specific engineering standards and have not yet incorporated performance standards into the inspection process. So who's going to be the unicorn? Who thinks it's a myth? Hands? It's interactive. <laughs> OK. OK, all right. And who thinks that's reality? Who, who wants to be the norwhale or the norwhale? Hands? OK, all right. Anyway. This is a myth. So let me go and explain that. Let's take some examples. Here was a situation um, talking about rabbit castration. So the regulatory requirement is major operative procedures on non-rodents will be conducted only in facilities intended for that purpose, which shall be operated and maintained under aseptic conditions. So we had a facility that could not build a dedicated surgery suite or they couldn't get a dedicated surgery area. So they came to us and said, well, look, how about if we use mobile laminal flow hoods for our rabbit neuters? And the way we looked at it, that satisfies the requirements. It's a clean area. Um, they're using aseptic technique, and that hood is dedicated to surgery. So we accepted that. So that's a very flexible approach to humane animal care. So that's an example of a performance approach. Another example. A naked mole rat colony. Well, as you know, we don't specifically have standards for this particular species. Uh, but this colony, or these animals, um, they have what's called eusocial behavior. So they live underground in a cat system, kind of like how ants live. Um, the regulatory requirement says, enclosures are to provide sufficient space to allow each animal to make normal postural and social adjustments with adequate freedom of movement. So this particular investigator had built a network of PVC pipes to mimic the underground conditions of these animals. It fulfills the requirement. It mimics the way these animals live. And they can express their normal social behavior. So this is acceptable. So this is another example of a performance approach to achieve the humane goals that we're looking for. So when we talk about the USDA inspector, what, what, do, what, do we, what does that inspector supposed to do? What is the inspector inspect, um, uh, expecting to do? So number one, the focus of the inspector is compliance with the regulations. So we're not going to break things down. This is engineering. This is performance. We look at what the regulations say, and we want to see that that facility is in compliance. Uh, the inspector understands that compliance can be achieved in many ways due to regulation flexibility and variation amongst facilities. And the expector has a lot of expertise within animal care to draw upon. We have diplomates from American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine, from the American College of Welfare. We have PhDs, and we have other subject matter experts. And the inspector accepts other references and standards, such as the guide, the ag, do, ag guide, and taxon-specific publications. So in summary, although not explicitly stated, the Animal Welfare Act regulations contain elements of engineering and performance standards. The regulations allow flexibility in meeting the requirements, and our inspectors are aware that facilities can achieve regulatory compliance in different ways. Of course, we're, ever, we're here to help. You can call us, ask us questions. Um, and also, we have a stakeholder registry. It's online, and if you're not a member, I encourage you to join. And this way, you can get updates and be kept in the know about what might be coming down the pike. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. All right, we'll move on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is Dr. Gilly Griffin who is the Director of Standards at the Canadian Council on Animal Care. Well, thank you very much to the organizers for um, inviting me to come and uh, join you. It's always really nice to come down uh, to the States. Uh, I've been joking with people that, you know, it's actually almost a parabolic flight to come down from Ottawa. But, you know, it's a really different country, and it's always really um, a good opportunity to come 
and to meet with people who are operating a different system, but we're all trying to meet the same goals. So I was really excited to come down because I was excited about seeing the cherry blossoms. Um, we don't even have leaves on the trees yet in our forest. So I'm going to talk about the Canadian Council on Animal Care and our approach to performance standards. So CCAC is responsible in Canada for overseeing the ethics of animal experimentation. It was established back in 1968. We've been around for a long time. But it's, it was established, and it still is, a non-legislated peer review system. We, um, as part of our mandate, though, we act on behalf of the people of Canada. And I think one of the differences, or one of the things that, that um, is um, important to stress is that we really do have public involvement in every uh, aspect of our program. We have members of the public who sit on our animal care committees. That's equivalent of your IACUCs. We have members of the public, community representatives, as we call them, who are involved in um, being on our, our council. But we also have members of the public, our community representatives, who are involved in assessment panels uh, that carry out the assessments of um, our institutions. The CCAC program is also a little bit unique in that it's both sets and maintains standards. So we have um, a program that develops the standards, and then we have a program that goes out and does the assessment of institutions and certifies institutions. Because there are very strong links between those two programs, it means that we are able to really sort of adapt to the research realities and um, feed those back into the generation of our standards um, as well as then feed those out um, back into the community. So there's a lot of sort of um, integrated learning that goes on throughout the system. When we're talking about standards, we're really talking about <coughs> policy statements, and those relate mainly to the functioning of our assessment and certification program, as well as guidelines documents. Now, our guidelines are developed by expert subcommittees, and we, we typically now develop uh, smaller documents. We move towards that um, approach rather than having sort of, we used to have a two-volume guide. But we moved to that approach so that we could um, update them more regularly and update them as sort of individual small um, chapters, if you like. So they're developed by expert subcommittees, which is then um, overseen by the Standards Committee. And that's one of the standing committees um, of the CCAC itself. So they sort of function as um, uh, um, a little mini board, if you like, that oversees the program. So this is the process that we go through when we're developing our standards. We uh, use our expert sub subcommittee to develop a preliminary draft. And that can take um, some considerable time because that's at the, at the point that we're really sort of looking at the science, looking at scientific evidence on which to ground our guideline statements. And then we go through um, several review stages, several draft stages, which go out for expert peer review, uh, for a widespread review when they're posted on the website and they're available for anybody to comment on, and then a, a final review. And at each point, the Standards Committee is responsible as a sort of gatekeeper for ensuring that the draft is ready to go out for review, that it lines up with other CCAC guidelines documents and um, to make sure that the process moves along before we get to a final approval by the Board of Directors and publication. So I like to say it's a bit of a glacial process. But actually, in terms of taking a very staged approach like that and taking our time, it does allow for significant buy-in from the community. So that by the time guidelines go out and are published, um, everybody in general has had an opportunity to have a look at them and have a shout at them. So our guidelines um, are written for a variety of audiences. They're written for investigators who are uh, writing their protocols and are wanting to know how their animals are going to be managed. They're written for animal care committee members who are responsible for reviewing those protocols and making sure that those protocols are in compliance with CCAC guidelines and policies. 
They're written for the veterinary and animal care staff who are uh, responsible for maintaining the health and well-being of those animals. And they're also written for our assessment panels um, who, when they go out to carry out assessment visits, use our guidelines um, as their standards um, and make recommendations based on the guidelines themselves. So we've already heard a little bit about this this morning. Our guidelines incorporate both must statements, which are, we see as mandatory requirements, and typically those are statements where an animal's welfare will really be compromised if that standard is not met, um, or it's a legislated or regulatory uh, requirement. Should is used uh, when we're trying to indicate an obligation for there might be exceptions, but those have to be adequately justified to an animal care committee um, and approved. And usually there has to be a, str a strong scientific justification for um, um, changing that requirement. So guidelines are really sort of an iterative <laughs> process. Um, they, they're, when you're developing them, they're a snapshot in time. They're based on sound scientific evidence. Um, and they're really intended to make sure that, that institutions can implement good practice. But they also provide a framework so that institutions are free to develop best practices. And what I don't have on this slide or, or in the presentation, actually, is we also develop a, um, a website, a microsite called the Three R's microsite, where we try and curate best practice documents so that um, institutions have those as a basis as well. But of course, times evolve, and those best practices, um, as they become published in the scientific literature, we hope, and as Pat was saying, you know, don't stay in the gray literature, and are taken up. And then when the guidelines are revised, and it's an opportunity for them to incorporate what was best practices back in the guideline document, if those best practices have indeed stood the test of time. So I mentioned our assessment program, um, and really they're responsible for the assessment of performance standards. Our assessment panels are composed of scientists, of veterinarians, as well as community representatives. Our assessments tend to be uh, formative. We're not an inspectorate, um, so we're really trying to encourage uh, learning and share best practices and so forth, as well as, as uh, really sort of grounding everything in our, in our standards. And as I mentioned before, um, when, uh, when the assessment um, panels carry out their, their assessments of institutions, then they write a report. And the recommendations they make in those reports are based on our, on our guidelines and policies. So because it's a sort of performance approach, they rely heavily on the experience and range of expertise on the panel. So typically, the scientists and veterinarians that they take out onto the panel will have expertise in the area of the, the research being carried out within the institution, as well as having a community representative that's called from the, the local community. So I think it's fair to say that the sort of performance approach has always been used by the CCAC. And our guidelines um, tend to be, therefore, a mix of performance standards as well as sort of more specific requirements. Um, and so in the next few slides, I'm just going to give you um, a few examples of what I mean. So these are examples that were pulled from the CCAC guidelines on the care and use of farm animals in research, teaching, and testing, which I think was published back in 2009. So just as a sort of um, example of a performance standard, we said that uh, flooring should provide a dry, comfortable lying surface. It should allow animals to go through their normal movements and postural changes without slipping, and it should not result in injuries. So it's telling you what the flooring should provide. It doesn't tell you that it has to be rubber matting. It doesn't tell you that it has to be sand. It doesn't tell you that it has to be packed straw. Um, and, you know, institutions will choose depending on their local circumstances and the types of barns they have and so forth. But as long as it meets those requirements, then that's fine. However, um, we did make specific requirements. So, for instance, where dairy cattle are housed within three stores, 
We made it a requirement that there should be at least one stall for each cow within the group. And that was based on scientific evidence that shows that the more that cattle are allowed, uh, are able to lie down, um, then you know, that minimizes um, incidence of hock injuries and, and lameness and it also improves milk production. So that's important for, um, to support our, our researchers that are, are working with dairy cattle and working on, on milk production, for instance. So it supports strong science, um, but it's more of a, a sort of a specific requirement based on sound scientific evidence. Similarly, with the CCAC guidelines on euthanasia of animals used in science, which was published in 2010, we, had, we developed 10 general guiding principles, uh, which said things like, you know, that the method used should uh, result in rapid loss of consciousness, the method used should minimize pain and distress. There was also a, a principle that it should um, also take into account the, 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 um, the, the people that were carrying out the euthanasia, providing that it didn't um, impact on animal welfare. So it, permitted, it permits animal care committees to accept new methods if they conform to the principles, and it gives them a set of principles against which they can, they can evaluate that method. However, we also developed a summary chart of acceptable methods of euthanasia for experimental animals, those that met those 10 principles, and conditionally acceptable those that, that were close but didn't quite meet those principles, uh, because that helped the animal care committees. It gave them a bit more guidance when they, were when they were looking at sort of protocols with common um, methods of euthanasia. Similarly, this is our most recent guideline, which is, uh, um, it went on, on, I think it was published on the website this last month, the CCAC guidelines on training of personnel working with animals in science. It's actually a revision of a 1999 guideline. And in the revision, we put much more emphasis on performance standards. So we gave the institutions the responsibility for providing evidence that all personnel involved with animals have the appropriate knowledge, skills, and competency to perform their required tasks without telling them how programs should be delivered or how they should be recording that training and so forth. However, in adjunct, uh, as an adjunct to that guideline, we also have a recommended syllabus. Um, so institutions are in no doubt about what they need to be able to um, teach or what they need to be able to make sure that people who are designing and carrying out experiments need to meet in order to be able to have the appropriate knowledge and skills. So one thing we found over the years in um, developing performance standards is oftentimes those need um, additional support. So typically when we publish guidelines, then we then publish implementation tools alongside the guideline to really provide additional support for institutions. So for instance, with the CCAC guidelines on the care and use of farm animals, um, we typically, with every guideline document, but, but we publish an implementation document which explains to institutions how we see those, those guidelines being implemented. So I just pulled from the implementation document this statement that while minimum space requirements for various types of animals are given, the document focuses more on requirements for the animals to be able to perform behaviors important for their welfare. So it's really sort of telling institutions what we're doing here is we're trying to implement performance standards. We had a lot of comments when we were developing the guidelines that people just wanted, they wanted to know the space requirement. But you know, it's difficult to set values that continue to be valid um, because particularly with farm animals, you know, the genetics means that animal sizes are, are rapidly increasing. Um, there may be breeds that are brought in that we haven't thought of um, in the guideline. So it's much better for people to sort of think through what those, what the performance standards are, what that means for the particular animals that they are housing within their institution. Similarly, with um, the CCAC guidelines on euthanasia animals used in science, one of the things that we often do is we often provide additional information documents. 
And so with this guidelines document, uh, we provided a document that um, looked at the effects of, of euthanasia methods on research results, because oftentimes uh, animal care committees are asked um, to, to uh, approve um, the use of a different method because it has an impact on, on people's research results. So we published an information um, document that helped animal care committees to look at what the evidence was um, for impact of euthanasia methods on, on common uh, research goals. And then with the new guidelines, the latest guidelines on training of personnel working with animals in science, uh, we haven't yet developed any implementation tools. And those are still under discussion. But what we'll probably do is we'll probably develop frequently asked questions. That's something we typically do with every guidelines document. And we see it as a way of responding um, in a generic manner to the questions that we've been asked during the development of the guidelines document. And then we'll probably also develop some supporting materials. So uh, we've had a lot of uh, feedback on um, how, how do we go about assessing competency. So we might develop something that uh, gives um, people um, um, a starter for 10 on how to do that. And then again, people are sort of saying, well, you know, we don't know what to do in terms of how to record training, how to record competency. So we might provide a template um, that enables people to do that, to, to use that template. If they see fit, fit, nothing wrong with them then going and developing their own uh, records or, or their own way of assessing competency if that meets the uh, performance standard. So in general, in, in implementing the performance standards, I think what it helps people to do is really to focus on the animal themselves. It's difficult sometimes, I agree, to assess, uh, particularly uh, when you're trying to assess um, the performance standards, not just in their typical housing, uh, in the manner that they're being held, but for animals undergoing procedures, when you really need to weigh up um, the, 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 um, the scientific goals against the needs of the animals. And really that you know, uh, speaks to having a good system in place in the institutions, a good animal care committee, good performance, um, good uh, post-approval monitoring. So in conclusion, um, in um, developing, assess, uh, implementing and assessing performance standards over the years, we think that they have a lot of benefits in that they do permit the evolution of best practices. And uh, also, I think it has benefits for us in that we're not having to revise guideline statements as, as regularly as we might if we weren't providing this, this framework. However, I recognize, and I think there are challenges, performance standards are not as easily measured. Um, and what they require, really, is a lot of careful thought. They require good judgment. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Griffin. Appreciate that talk. So our last speaker to finish out the morning session is um, Dr. Judy MacArthur Clark. And Dr. Clark is the head of the Animals and Science Regulation Unit of the UK Home Office. So we'll get a, a European and UK perspective. Thank you. So thank you very much indeed. And, th and thank you so much for inviting me uh, to come over and join you for this meeting. One of the disadvantages, of course, of being fifth in, in the, the listing is that a lot of what's or what I was going to say has already been covered, but that's really interesting because it says to me that we're all actually tackling the same problems in very similar ways. So what I'll do is take you through some of the particular things we've been doing in the UK and how that fits in with the US regulatory, with the um, European regulatory system. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the support. Oops, I'm losing my microphone now. Acknowledge the support of my colleague Naomi Roberts, who's. Uh, Helped me a lot with these slides. She's one of our inspectors in the UK. And I'm not sure if I can. There we go. That's better. Okay. 
um, and uh, has given me a lot of on the ground advice of what's actually happening out there in, in facilities in the UK. Okay, uh, is that the right way for this? Yes. So a lot of people get confused about the European regulatory system. So I thought it would be just helpful to just give you a little bit of guidance on how that operates. Um, so if you see at the top of the, the, the slide here, um, we've got the European Directive 2010-63, which was the directive that was passed in the year 2010, and has an annex, which is Annex 3. And as you can see, Annex 3 lists mandatory standards for uh, application throughout the European member states. Um, there's also referenced in that directive a commission recommendation, which is based upon Appendix A, and some of you may remember that. That was the document that we spent years and years and years getting concluded and a lot of consultation with stakeholders right across Europe to achieve that. And Commission Recommendation Appendix A, because it's, it's referenced in the directive, also has standing and therefore is part of EU legislation. But it's not mandatory, it is advisory. And so we have those two pieces of, um, of those two documents that we need to reference in terms of how we then apply EU legislation into UK legislation, which is what I and my team do in, in the UK. And so we've delivered mandatory standards, which are in compliance with Annex 3, and I'll explain a little bit more in a moment. And we've also delivered advice, which is based upon Appendix A. So hopefully that sort of clarified the overall picture for you. Now let's see how that works in terms of UK legislation. So here we see the UK legislation. On the mandatory standard side, we've looked at two different aspects. So this is applying Appendix 3, Annex 3, sorry, and, and we've got some parts that are applicable to all species, and those, generally speaking, are performance standards. So they make more general statements about what you should achieve, what should be the outcome of what you're doing with those all, all species. And then we have a series of species-specific parts to that, which are generally engineering standards. And those are all published in this volume here, which I brought a copy with me. Um, I didn't actually put the link to this. It's available on our website, but I'll make sure that's added on these slides before they, they get put onto the ILA website so that you can look it up. It's, a, it's quite an extensive document, and I'll explain in a moment what also we have in here. So basically, we've taken those mandatory and um, mandatory standards and, and divided them into sections that are applicable to all species, which we look at as performance standards, and the species-specific ones, which are largely engineering standards. And on the advice side, we've added an additional section to this, which is largely based on Appendix A+. Plus. Um, so there's a lot more information than just what is in Appendix A. It's in, in, information which is helping to guide people in how to achieve those mandatory standards. So it's part of this journey that I think most of the speakers have talked about in terms of how do we evolve our standards and how do we move forward so that we're constantly improving standards. But within that information, there are some engineering standards. So it's not just, the advice is not just about performance standards. There are some parts in there that you would classify as engineering standards. And in fact, that advisory part of the document is by far the larger section in the overall document. So a little bit of definitions. I've only got 20 minutes instead of the longer time that Pat had, so I'm going to do very quick definitions here. Uh, but just so that we know what we're talking about. For me, uh, for us, engineering standards are defined measurable parameters. So there's a range of them. They could be cage sizes, temperature ranges, photo period, trough length with some species, perch length with other species, and so on like that. So these are defined, and they're very measurable. Performance standards, and we've used this. I've been really struck how much people have talked about outcomes today, and that word keeps coming up. And I think that's a word we can really focus on in terms of the discussion that we have here about performance standards, because outcomes is constantly what we need to be considering and, and measuring, monitoring, um, as best we can in terms of performance standards. So these may be, and I've used a couple of examples here, walls and floors should be sur surfaced with a material resistant to heavy wear and tear, noise levels, including ultrasound, shall not adversely affect animal welfare. These are about performance standards. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, and it's about the outcome. 
that you achieve from those standards. I think it's important that we don't think of engineering standards as being mandatory and performance standards as being advisory. And I think that's a trap that we can readily fall into because it's more difficult to measure the performance standards. They evolve into becoming softer and more advisory. And it is possible that you can have performance standards that will be mandatory. And again, I think that'll be part of our discussion going forward over the rest of today and tomorrow to make sure that we don't start slipping into that trap. Both engineering standards and performance standards can be either mandatory or advisory. I said earlier, we have some engineering standards in our, the advisory part of our code of practice. And likewise, we have a number of performance standards which we consider to be mandatory. So why do we use engineering standards then? Well, and this has come up with others as well, they're the hard bottom line. They're, they tend to be the welfare safety net for individual species. And they set clear expectations to establishments, institutions, as you would call them, and to manufacturers of equipment and suppliers and so on. They set clear expectations in that sense. They also tend to satisfy public expectations. So we tend to use them in this sense to be able to say, well, this is, this is something that below which people will not go. And of course, and my illustration of the measuring tape here is, is mind, mindful because they are easy to verify for compliance. Um, and I think historically, they've probably been much more the model for compliance monitoring. But both I in the UK and across Europe, and from what I hear here today and previously in the US, we know that actually the measuring tape is no longer what we want to be focusing on. So there is a role for engineering standards. But why do we need to use performance standards then? Well, because every establishment and every, uh, every experiment is different. And another word I keep hearing today is flexibility. And we need to have flexibility because we live in a very dynamic and flexible scientific environment. The reason why these animals are here in our facilities is to serve the purpose of delivering scientific outcomes. And we have to be flexible to the different types of science that's being practiced. So establishments vary and experiments and science will vary. It's also not essential for us to mandate how good animal welfare should be achieved. Um, there are many ways to achieve this. And it's much better that by using performance out standards and focusing on the outcome, we can actually allow people to develop different ways of achieving good welfare. And thirdly, and I think this is again something that people have talked about already, laboratory animal welfare is constantly advancing. We're learning all of the time. And it's really important that we can set our standards in such a way that we can build on that, um, that flexibility, on that advance, advancement, rather than blocking it because we've, we've pinned ourselves in with performance standards. So we believe that that's really important. But the challenge, of course, is agreeing what is acceptable. Who, who determines, who defines the performance outcomes? And how do you do that? And part of that is about what is good welfare. And we heard earlier about some things like looking at the at outcomes for the animals in terms of growth and reproduction and so on like that. But we all of us know situations where growth and reproduction are not necessarily measures of good welfare. So we need to be open-minded and think carefully about how are we going to measure good welfare? What is that good welfare? And, and I've raised a point here, which is a point that we're looking at more in the UK, perhaps more around farm animals, and whether they, not necessarily whether they live in an environment of good welfare, but whether they've had a life worth living. And I think that's something that we might challenge ourselves with, with some of our research animals. Have we provided an environment for them such that they did, in spite of the fact that they were having research carried out on them and so on, that they were able to have a life worth living? And I think that's, um, that's quite an interesting challenge for us to move our discussion towards, perhaps. So who defines that? Well, we probably have two. We, we consider that we have two levels, at the community level and at the cage side level. And both of those are really important in terms of defining these outcomes. For us in Europe and in the UK, we've put a lot of effort into this community level, 
partly because we see that as an opportunity for individual European member states to share ideas and, and to raise their own practices to, to, uh, from uh, their historical practice through to good practice and eventually up to best practice. So we have international expert panels um, that lead to addressing issues within the European legislation. So a number of those will look at uh, things like we've, we've been heard people talking about training and, and competency. So how do we deliver training and competency, not only in individual member states, but also to allow free movement of scientists between member states? So that's quite a, that's a classical example of looking at performance outcomes from, from that perspective. So we've got a community in Europe that is using these expert panels led by the European Commission to develop some understanding of performance outcomes. And then within the UK, my unit leads on developing advisory notes, codes of practice. I've pointed out our code of practice, which we spent about three years developing and published at the end of last year. And we use wide stakeholder engagement in, in, in that, partly in order to draw on the expertise of our stakeholders and partly also to um, engage them so that when the final document is published, there are no great surprises. And an example of that is the advisory part of our code of practice. Um, we had two very diametrically op opposed views on that. On the animal protection and welfare side, they wanted that to be expanded to be the equivalent of a massive, almost an encyclopedia Britannica of, of animal welfare. And on the science side, they wanted it taken out. They didn't want it at all. They said no, because people will misunderstand it, and they'll assume that it's mandatory. So we had this sort of diversity of opinion, if one can put it that way. It got pretty hot at times. But by getting people into the room and having the dialogue, and then ensuring that the way we expressed what that advisory part meant, so in the introduction of the code of practice, we've been very clear about what the role of that part is and how we're going to use that to raise performance standards, um, then we were able to get satisfaction from all sides. So the community needs to be a very diverse community in terms of developing and understanding the role of performance standards. And then the cage side view is equally important. And this is the sort of active, all the time, ongoing review, animal care staff and veterinarians, investigators. But I have put the point there that you have to be aware of conflict of interest, and I'm sure we all know what that means. I've mentioned our home office inspectors there, so we have a slightly different inspection system in the UK from that which you're familiar with here in the US, and our inspectors are regularly inspecting facilities. They may be going in on a monthly basis or more frequently than that in, in larger facilities, and they're part of the advisory system uh, of raising and sharing performance outcomes and so on, so we use that as a mechanism to share information and help people to benchmark themselves against what's going on in other places. And of course, strategy development oversight by what we call AWERBs, our Animal Welfare and Ethical Review Boards, what you in here would refer to as your IACUCs, really important, particularly from our perspective and from the perspective of our inspectors, is if they're looking at something and they're being told, yes, this is this is a performance standard, this is how we've decided to do it. If it's just the PI who's saying that, that's going to carry much less weight than if the PI went to the equivalent of the eye cook and presented the case and said, I think this is the right way to do it with my animals. So it's about showing that you've thought strategically about it and that you have got this team approach that people have referred to. And professional judgment. How many times have we heard that mentioned this morning? really important, and that's part of the team approach and the team delivery. So who defines performance outcomes? And I think this is where guidance is really essential. Guidance helps us to develop a shared understanding of what is or isn't acceptable. And it doesn't have that, somebody we've heard reference earlier about, if you put something into regulations, it's very inflexible and it You've got to republish. And for me, I have to go back to Parliament when I publish something, which means I've got to take it through all of that process. So really, my guidance is really important to help that 
flexibility and allow the evolution. And it shares that understanding between an, an entities, between institutions, and allows them to start benchmarking themselves. And one of the things we find is that once we can empower benchmarking and assist people with benchmarking, they will then drive themselves through their own cycles of self-improvement. So here are some examples. What do the following mean? Environmental enrichment shall be adapted to the species and individual needs of the animals concerned. So that's a statement in our code of practice. But what does that actually mean in practice? Likewise, temperature and relative humidity in the holding rooms should be adapted to the species and age groups housed. So we're looking for evidence that that is being delivered. And we recognize that in a normal distribution curve, there will be some situations where you're out at the extremes of the curve. And there can be good justification for those. So it's about understanding that and using guidance to understand the principles that underlie this. So guidance for performance standards, it might give suggestions for enrichment for different species. Uh, we offer suggested temperature and humidity ranges, but that doesn't mean you absolutely have to stay within those. You can have good rationale for not doing so. We give typical species housing needs, bearing in mind we still have the engineering standards for the minimum housing requirements. Typical social needs for other species, including different sexes and ages, and bearing in mind that different strains may behave differently uh, from a social perspective. And uh, another example here is species-specific dietary advice. So this is the guidance part of it. And we try to link all of that with background papers where possible and with evidence. So what that means in the structure of the code of practice that we've done, there are a number of sections. It starts with an executive summary and introduction, which talks about the legal structure. And that's the piece I referenced earlier that explains what is the status of this code of practice and the different parts of it. Um, section one includes both engineering and performance standards that are mandatory now. Because of the way the European Directive worked, we have some higher standards that will come into practice in January 2017. So section two is about that, to give people now notice of what they'll be expected to do in two years' time. And section three is this advisory part, which is not mandatory. And then in order to support that, we've got a bibliography and a glossary of terms as well. But the bibliography is an attempt to try and draw together at least a selection of the literature that supports the advice that's being given. And both of those can be expanded documents. Both the advice and the bibliography can be expanded documents at a later stage. And both engineering and performance standards are used in, throughout the code of practice. So what's our experience been so far with this then? And we published this at the end of last year, but no surprises, people knew already what was coming out in it. What we found is that the non-mandatory advice over which we had this big battle is being found to be useful. It gives guidance on how to approach the mandatory outcomes, how you might achieve those, and it also sets future aspirations for people. Users and regulators, and by that I mean the people working in the facilities, and by regulators, that's also my inspectors as well. They need all of them to be comfortable with the idea that the advice is flexible, and that's been a really important journey for all of us. So you can't have users thinking it's flexible and inspectors who are going in and mandating it. So it's been really important to make sure that all sides of the equation see this in the same way, with the same aspirations, in terms of this is a direction of travel that we can all move together in. And increased emphasis on establishments justifying their decisions and strategies through their animal welfare ethical review bodies, their IACUCs. Interestingly, establishments, and this is not going to come to surprise from what I've heard earlier as well, they prefer performance standards. They'd like to have fewer engineering standards. Equipment manufacturers would like more engineering standards. And animal welfare groups would like more engineering standards. So uh, somebody said earlier, I think it was David said about the position of the regulators, yeah, it, it is between a rock and a hard place in some ways. And we're trying to balance all of this, and we're trying to get everything to work in the best way possible at the end of the day for the animals. But you have to be recognizing that there are a number of quite interesting perspectives there. So in conclusion then, um, we found that engineering standards, we believe, are really providing a welfare safety net. They are important from that perspective. 
and they do give reassurance to the public. So I don't think we should discard engineering standards totally, but we do have the opportunity with performance standards to put animal welfare first. And both of these, therefore, and I've heard the word balance again this morning a number of times, both of these need to be balanced into an effective system. Guidance is essential, and I think that's part of what's going to be coming out of these two days of this conference, is essential to ensure a shared interpretation and expectation of what acceptable performance is. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So what we will do now is we'll have our Q&A session with the morning speakers. So if all of our speakers would come up to the front um, and bring, your, bring your, um, your tents with your names on them, please, so everybody knows. Um, the audience members, we have microphones stationed on both sides. Is there, you can come to the microphone, and please do so that we can record your voice so that um, everybody online can also hear it. And then those of you online, please, um, please submit your questions, and we'll bring those in and read those as well. So I'll open up the floor to questions. All right, I'll, I'll start a question. I'll start with one question. So um, one, of our, one of the topics in our discussion um, of the previous uh, workshop on reproducibility in science is the need for us to be publishing negative data, for us to be basically putting out information that even though is not um, exciting, is important in moving science forward. And I think the same could be true from the standpoint of us developing performance standards. And in that, is, is there a way, do you all think there is a way that we can put out there what doesn't work and why it didn't work and how, how best we could probably possibly do that? And I don't want to mean to put that on you all as, you know, the regulatory inspections as um, you know, these are failures, but it's more, you, you all may have more opportunity to see those that in situations that may not work exactly as an intended, but then also how they moved forward from there to, to make it a good performance standard. So I'll leave it with that. Well, I'll speak up. Um, actually, this had come up once before. I spoke uh, to a, a group of researchers, and we talked about it in the context of not using animals or using not using animals unnecessarily. And I had found out that on, in certain research circles, there is sort of an unofficial. I wouldn't say it's a publication, but people do discuss what doesn't work out. Um, but a lot of people are afraid to come forward and make it an official publication for many reasons. But there are discussions in certain circles about what doesn't work out, and that information is shared. And at the meeting I was at, we talked about, well, let's bring this forward um, to kind of bring it to a greater level. Uh, I was looking at it from an animal welfare point that why waste animals on something that you know is not going to work. So maybe this is the venue to kind of resurrect this and get this community thinking about publishing things that don't work um, from an animal welfare viewpoint. Uh, Ola is currently involved in helping our community to implement our new um, standards on significant uh, change, uh, significant changes to previously approved animal protocols. Um, and as you know, we prefer to focus on what's positive. We've asked uh, our community to submit uh, developing uh, significant change policies to the iCook Administrators Association website where they can be published um, anonymously if, if the institution so chooses. 
uh, to enable the community to all work together and develop good working uh, guidelines and standards to work together to improve, which doesn't uh, ex express exactly what you um, you ask for, Dave, but in a performance standard, I think it moves us to the place we want to be, which is working together to get better welfare for the animals, and in this case, also to reduce regulatory burden. Um, we, in, in the UK, um, we're very aware that we've got an inspectorate that sees everything that goes on. So I've got a group of, of just around two dozen veterinarians who between them see everything that's happening in the UK because they're inspecting all of the establishments in the UK on a regular basis. And I think just in the last few years, we've become increasingly conscious of how important that resource is particularly to share best practice. But I think what you've raised there, David, is a, an interesting idea, which I'd like to take back with me, which is to, to share the bits that didn't quite work as well as they might have done. Um, but I think, though, you have to be very cautious about what doesn't work, because something that may not have worked in one particular environment may work very well in another environment. So a lot of this is environment um, relative. And I think something that really we do need is some mechanism whereby people can freely exchange their experience, um, feel comfortable to exchange that experience, get feedback from others out in the field as well. Um, we had a brief conversation earlier about the idea that we could have some sort of, uh, I, I hate the word database, so we're not going to set up a database or anything. If people say that to me, I scream. Um, but the idea that in modern world you can have active engagement of people into some sort of wiki type of environment where they can share ideas. And once you get into the habit of talking about the things that went really well and the things that didn't go quite so well, I think people would start to open up a lot more. But I think there's always this caution I, I have that um, remember the environment in which that, that work is being done. It, what didn't work in one place may work quite well in another. If I can just make one comment on this as well, I think um, I think this concept of negative data or things that don't seem to show a clear um, finding, this is important work, and we have started to see this being published, and it really depends a little bit on the spin that's put on this. So, you know, it's always disappointing for a student or for a group to have something, especially when their hypothesis was that something would work, and it doesn't seem to um, induce any changes. Um, but again, if the spin on that is a welfare impact, so for example, um, you know, perhaps an analgesic doesn't work in a particular situation or an alteration in the environment didn't appear to have a significant impact, those are still important results that need to be shared with the greater community. The important thing for any type of data that's generated is that there is rigor for it, and that is part of um, being able to publish that. So I agree that we should have a mechanism for sharing information, but we also need to recognize a certain standard for that information. And if a study is performed well, even if the results are uh, counter to the hypothesis, perhaps, that was um, the initial basis for that work, it should still be publishable. I think I'll just add briefly to it. I mean, I, I, I quite agree with the sort of need to publish negative results, at least for um, the sort of scientific studies. I think it's a little bit more of a challenge when we're looking at things that are sort of animal welfare related and knowing, you know, how much we struggle when we're trying to find evidence for some of the things that we know are working well in practice and that we're only able to sort of publish on our microsite because it's best practices that we've managed to get um, people from the community to write about, um, really just getting people to actually publish um, things would be, would be wonderful because there's a lot of stuff that um, exists in the gray literature. When I know from, from you know, our point of view, if we then put that into our guidelines documents, it won't stand um, because people will want you know, sound scientific evidence um, so just, yeah, just getting, just getting publications out there would help. 
I guess. Um, oh. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your uh, talks. And um, I want to just ask uh, one question of clarification and then a more general question of the panel. Um, I will identify myself. Yes, thank you. I'm Paul Locke. I'm from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, my question of clarification is for you, Dr. Turner. Um, when I was taking notes on your presentation, I noticed you used the term, I think it was practical or practice standard as well as performance standard. And I may have missed something. You may have, um, maybe, maybe I didn't get that right, but I wanted to make sure that I understood what those were. And then my general question for the panel is um, really to ask you to extend your discussion that you started about the process by which we incorporate this important information about the new performance standards. I think um, I won't use the term database because I, I agree with Dr. MacArthur Clark that that's not the right way to do this. But my question to you is, what is the right way? How do we fully engage our communities and the public to get this information to a place where it can be fully discussed, vetted, and validated? Thank you, Paul. Um, so practice standards um, is really uh, a larger term then that we can use to uh, think about what is acceptable in terms of um, uh, how, how uh, procedures and other things are done within the facility. And, and like these other standards that we've talked about, it does evolve over time. And um, it does consist of of sort of what is generally accepted to be the appropriate um, skills, treatment, you know, attitudes towards animals and things that occur um, within um, the body of laboratory animal science and therefore within institutions. So performance standards um, may contribute to the practice of laboratory animal science in the long run and to therefore the standards that are acceptable. But it's, it's a, a larger term then that sort of embodies what is accepted today. So in terms of um, performance standards and, and, and getting the community to understand performance standards, which I think is what you were, were sort of asking. I mean, from our perspective, you know, we have our assessment panels which go out to carry out assessments of institutions. Those um, assessment panels are made up of scientists, of veterinarians, and community representatives. But of course, they're also led by a director of assessment and certification that's based at the CCAC. So as we go across Canada, you know, we do a lot of sharing of best practices. Our assessments are very much sort of a formative experience. And so, you know, it's an opportunity for institutions to ask a lot of questions and get a lot of advice um, and understanding from the panel um, who then go back to their own institutions because uh, you know those scientists are carrying out research somewhere else as that veterinarian is part of an animal facility somewhere else um, and I know that you know people have told me that the best learning experience for them has been being part of a, a CCAC assessment panel and I think also I mean you know in terms of linking performance standards to practice standards for us, we have found that we have to provide sometimes additional support material, but we also are fortunate in having our three R's microsite in the sense that we can do some curation of best practices and at least sort of uh, post those, those there for people to pick up and use. Um, I have to say, though, it's a little bit resource intensive, and so uh, we probably suffer a little bit at the moment from not having <laughs> sufficient resources to make it work as beautifully as we would like to. Um, I, th I think there's not one total solution in terms of the sharing. I think it's one of these big challenges, isn't it, that um, we all recognize the need to have much better sharing. One of the barriers we find is that certainly um, in terms of improvements, uh, standards around uh, development of experimental models and so on, um, because we work in an environment that's somewhat or has in the past been somewhat secretive and, and confidential and retained material in confidence, that doesn't actually engender an environment where people do share best practice. So, for example, improvements in developing surgical models and so on. Um, I can remember sort of 15 years ago, I'm the one doing history now, um, 15, 20 years ago, that it was much more open 
And then it seemed to sort of close up again. And I think now we're seeing the world becoming much more open and transparent. Certainly, we've been on a big drive in the UK over the last four or five years on openness and transparency. And that actually is making the world a less threatening place. So maybe there's something we need to learn about there. I talked a bit earlier about um, we become increasingly aware that within our group of inspectors, we have a lot of um, ability to share best practice. And part of the blocker of that has been sort of the concern about confidentiality and what can you and can't you talk to people about. So we're looking at ways in which we can try and remove some of those barriers and ease some of those conversations that can take place. And another thing that we've been um, focusing on and increasingly looking at now is the idea about doing, instead of just doing um, what you might call vertical inspections, that is an inspector goes in and inspects an institution, we're actually going to re reassign some of our resource on inspection into what we're calling um, horizontal inspections. So that's thematic inspections. And some of those thematic inspections will have um, part of it around performance standards um, and will be learning lessons around performance standards. So then that allows us to be able to use vehicles like our annual report and public meetings and so on to be able to talk about what we have seen across the board. It can be anonymized, but it actually allows us to talk about and share best, best practice more effectively, I think. So those are just some examples of things that we can do, but I don't think we've got the total solution. And I'm here to listen to other ideas as well, please, because I think this is a challenge for us all about how we can share best practice across different institutions and how we can help people to understand where the benchmark is. We all work within our own institutions, or most people do. And unless you know how you compare with other similar institutions, you don't really know whether you're top, middle, or bottom. You may think you're great, but actually you're somewhere down near the bottom. Or you may really be slogging hard, and actually you're way up at the top. But it's quite difficult for people to know that, I think. So a bit more work on that could be quite helpful, I think. Paul, I, I think your question was about you know sharing and publication, but it was also about institutions implementing performance standards. And it seems to me, I already revealed my hand that I'm really in favor of grassroots um, understanding. And performance uh, standards are, in my mind, intended to support and improve the welfare of the animals. And therefore, I think we should look to the people that have contact with the animals who are out there every day doing their jobs, observing the animals, and attempting to find ways to improve what they do and improve their jobs. And we need to listen to the vets and the animal care staff and the investigators who are daily uh, coming up with these ideas. And for the USDA, we don't have, I don't have anything else to add to what everyone is saying, other than the fact that, that we do promote and support meetings um, for sharing of best practice and, and open venues so that we can discuss. And of course, all of us as veterinarians keep up with the current veterinary practices. So this is our contribution to the greater cause. Um, Bob Wirtz, um, NIH. Uh, I talk to uh, my fellow primate researchers in all of the areas represented here. But um, it's striking to me that we're talking about three areas, Europe, Canada, and the United States. But there are four representatives from regulatory authorities from those, uh, those entities. And what I wonder is, it, can there be any possible benefit of having a, a divided uh, regulatory control in, in the United States for uh, animal experimentation? And is the United States unique in that respect? Uh, we'll answer together. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has come up before. I mean, the, the point is, um, I've had people ask me, well, why is there an OLA and why is there a USDA and why can't we combine that? Why can't we take one inspection and have it good for everything? And the point is, is the way things are set up. We support the Animal Welfare Act. Um, and every regulatory agency supports a specific act, like the FDA it supports an act. So we are following the regulations, and we have to do what we're told to do 
by Congress. So that's why you're seeing, you know, different regulatory agencies. And I guess Olar will speak. Well, you know what they say about laws and, and sausage. Um, but their mission, the USDA's mission, is different from ours. They are a regulatory agency. They interpret and, um, and uh, enforce or what were the law. NIH is a scientific agency. Uh, compliance with us is entirely optional. It's only required if you want our money. <laughs> so our guidelines are not laws. We conduct oversight to help you stay in compliance with the guidelines that enable you to legally receive appropriated funds. We've had a, a memorandum of understanding uh, with the USDA for a long time. And since um, all of the uh, uh, policy and laws that I talked about in, that um, were worked on in 1985, there's been terrific work to try to harmonize our um, expectations. And so we work closely with USDA in an attempt to make sure that our, our expectations are not in conflict. When we publish our FAQs, we review the ones that are um, uh, about shared issues. So that would exclude things about compliance with the NIH guide for grants and contracts. The USDA has no interest in that. Um, but the ones that are about animal welfare, we agree on those before they're published. And when we do have slight differences in our expectations, we try to make that clear, too. Um, we appear on the podium together. We harmonize our um, published guidelines. So I understand that it is difficult out there in the community, but we have different missions that we work toward. But, but at the, at the e EU, there are, there are two sources of regulation as well. In, in the UK, there are UK regulations, and there are also EU regulations. Well, I was going to say it would be inappropriate for me to comment on your question coming from outside the USA. I would say, actually, if it works, don't break it might be a good starting point. But in the EU, yes, we, we set regulations at a European level, and we then implement those in UK legislation, which can be quite a tortuous process but it does mean that we're basically, all the EU member states are aligned. Now, um, we took two years to negotiate and agree a directive that we passed in 2010. We then had to implement that by January 2013, so all member states were in the process of implementing that. We were not allowed to apply higher standards than the directive unless they were already in place in 2010 at the time directive was passed. So we couldn't sneak extra things in. Um, we could only apply higher standards if they were already in place. So you'd think that that would be a highly harmonized process. But I have to tell you that if you were working under my regulations in the UK and you crossed the channel to France, you wouldn't recognize the same piece of legislation because different member states implement it in different ways. And, and that's why part of the challenge, when I said earlier about free movement, we want to have scientists able to move freely throughout Europe. We'd like them to be able to move freely to the US and vice versa as well. Um, and the key piece around that is the standards of training for competency can be common. And I think we've elevated those standards quite nicely with the harmonized legislation. But the one training module that I think we will never be able to harmonize is that if the French scientist wants to come and work in the UK, they will have to do the module about the UK legislation because without doing it, they won't understand the framework within which they're operating and vice versa. If a UK scientist went to France, they would have to do the module for the French legislation. So it's not as simple as it might look. You, Europe is not totally harmonized, but there are harmonized, there's quite a bit of harmony there. It's always interesting coming to an international meeting because, you know, at the end of the day, we're all trying to achieve the same ends, but of course, everybody has different structures, different legal structures within their country, and so you are bound by that.
Um, but, you know, we learn from each other a lot about how um, other people have managed to implement things. And then I always find it interesting to then go back and reflect on how uh, that might pertain in Canada. I mean, we don't have any federal legislation, but as Pat just reminded me, you know, we have provincial legislation across the country that relating to animal welfare. And of course, that means that you're then trying to deal with um, 10 different um, pieces of, of legislation that you have to be mindful of when you're trying to implement something that's a, a national system. And, and I was just going to say that our memorandum of understanding is with NIH and the FDA. So we all work together to harmonize. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dave Anderson, a member of the organizing committee for this workshop, and I'm here to uh, present some of the questions and comments from the online participants for the workshop. Uh, we'd like to thank the online participants for their willingness to address the conference. Uh, we think it uh, both helps the interactive nature as well as enriches the discussion throughout. And I will have to offer a bit of an apology. Um, I have taken a little bit of editorial license to tweak some of the uh, questions or comments a bit, uh, both to uh, maintain a bit of anonymity as well as broaden the general scope to give our uh, expert panel the best opportunity they can to address the issues. So with those caveats in place, uh, the first question we have is, in using performance standards to assess welfare, how do you qualify the outcome of no observable effect in the context of trying to reach a good effect or avoid a bad effect? Seems to be a good question. <laughs> We, we encourage our uh, stakeholders, our constituents, to ask us questions. And we, um, Ola, uh, allows our, our PS Assured institutions to um, suggest a different way that they would like to achieve the objective um, in a should statement in the guide. And we will work with them to determine and to understand if the welfare of the animals is the same or better under the me mechanism that they propose, then we would be fine with them going ahead with that. Does that address the question? Yeah, I think so. I, I think the question really is focused on that, that challenge and being able to accurately assess, assess the impact, and really everybody's trying for good effects, but sometimes that's not readily apparent, and so is, in fact, that something you have to step away from? Does it, do we really require a demonstrable good effect, or is neutral effect something left up, as you just said, to the institution, and certainly everyone wants to stay away from bad effects? These are big, big hypothetical questions, and it's a problem that all of us on these panels asking questions face. Um, because you're not applying performance standards in a large hypothetical universe. You're applying it to particular animals in a particular situation. And so we would begin to unpack this question by asking specifics about the animals. And so when I went quickly, when I flashed through all those FAQs um, and I put the most emphasis on the rodent housing one. We talked about ways to assess the adequacy of the housing, and we talked about ways to ex uh, assess um, the quality of life or the health of the animals. And so I would, I, my, my thought for this questioner is you need to look deeper into your system because there are specifics there. Okay, thank you. I, th I think I'd also add to that. Um, I mean, there's a basic principle of, of first do no harm. And, and I think we have seen situations where people have, with the best of meanings, ha have taken an approach to, for example, environmental enrichment, where actually if you analyzed it carefully, you would find that actually you were doing harm. So I think a null effect to me would be totally neutral. There's no harm done, there's no good done. And I think you just have to look at 
how much effort goes into doing whatever it is you're doing and is it worthwhile? Um, so it is very hypothetical, the question, but there is a good point around it in terms of whatever we think is going to have a really good outcome, it's always worth assessing what the outcome is because you might actually be doing harm without realizing it. Thank you. One of the, t so I just wanted to add to that, that I think one of the tools that we sort of really need to develop um, and put more emphasis on at the moment is the development of good guidance for welfare assessment. I think that's something that we find um, institutions struggle with. Okay, if I may, just one more question then. Uh, and this one is directed towards uh, Dr. MacArthur Clark. Um, and the uh, requester would like to know your thoughts on the Stop Vivisection European Citizens Initiative and what kind of impact do you think that may have on performance standards in the EU? Um, so I have to preface my comments by saying that, um, and I explained this to Lida when I accepted the invitation to come here, we're in a pre-election period in the UK at the moment, uh, which means that I'm in Perda which means that I can't say anything about what the future may hold. I can only cover about what policies that we've determined in the past. So I'm afraid I can't really comment very much on the European Citizens Initiative from a, from a government perspective. Um, and indeed, it's with the European Parliament at the moment, which means that I, as a, a, as a UK competent authority, don't play any role at the moment in the process that it undergoes. I, I won't go into all, all the go processes that go with citizens' initiatives. What I can say, I think, is from a personal perspective, I said earlier, we spent two years at negotiating and achieving a directive that was acceptable to all 28 member states of the European Union. We engaged heavily with the Euro European animal welfare bodies, animal protection bodies, as well as the science communities, right across politics to get that uh, European Parliament, MEPs and so on, to get that directive through. And uh, that has now been implemented by every single European member state. Uh, and the Citizens Initiative is asking for that uh, directive to be abrogated, that is uh, taken away. Um, and so you might hypothesize what my views would be about whether that is a sensible thing to do at this stage when European member states are working really hard to implement what is, um, I believe, a, a really good directive and a good piece of legislation. So I can't go beyond that at the moment. Thank you. Kathy Liss with Animal Welfare Institute. And I appreciated um, particularly the remarks from Dr. MacArthur Clark this morning and believe that a lot of that is relevant and very useful when we look at the situation in the US. And particularly when we're looking at having a welfare safety net. And I would argue, just as you say, not to mess with it if it's not broken, that we are very much broken here in the US because that safety net is not where it should be in assuring basic animal welfare. And the, the problem being the disparity between having a NIH guy that has, excuse me, calling it NIH, a guide that's moved forward um, and in many ways embodies, I think, a, a more thorough assessment though lacking in um, specificity that the welfare community would like to see. And on the other hand, having the enforcement mechanism be within USDA, which number one, isn't covering the vast majority of animals used, the rats, mice, and birds. And secondly, whose standards are so woefully out of date um, because they haven't kept up with um, all that we've learned over time and allow for greater welfare across the board. There is that requirement for primates, but really that requirement for improving the welfare of the other animals is lacking. And I'm worried that the research community is stymied by fear of raising that standard and requiring it across the board. And, and I would hope there would be an opportunity to come together and, and uh, agree that we could improve that safety net in a way that assures welfare and still allows research to be conducted. And I wondered if you might be able to, uh, panelists, respond to your thoughts on that. And that is having more of this um, looking perhaps at uh, revising the standards, um, perhaps revising the Animal Welfare Act if that's needed, such that it embodies 
uh, some of the principles within the guide. Well, thank you for the, the question. Um, all I can say is that there's a mechanism. If um, people want to make a revision to the act, then you can always, um, well, we've got some going on right now. Uh, you can um, put in a petition. And, um, and then we would put the petition out for comment. And you know, once we evaluate the comments, uh, the USDA would determine if there's a need to go forward and let's say change the standards as you're talking about. I will say that, uh, yes, those standards were written a while ago, but we still have the flexibility. You know, there's not, there's, we're not standing in the way of progress. We still have professionally accepted standards, currently accepted veterinary practices. We still have that language built there. So, and we have allowed for the evolution. I mean, look, look how far we've come with non-human primates. And we're not standing in the way of any other type of evolution. So um, if the public wants to make a change, we do have a mechanism to make that change. And um, hi, Kathy. I, I hear your statement. I believe I understand your statement. I don't agree that the animal welfare system in this country is broken. I do uh, think that OLA is appropriately um, guiding the community toward the implementation uh, of this guide. Um, and uh, I think that our, our grassroots approach is um, uh, providing the best welfare for the animals. Excuse me, I wondered, Dr. Silk, if you, were, if you could perhaps explain um, how you ensure compliance institution by institution, aside from the submission of an insurance, what kind of uh, enforcement mechanism there, there is? Well, um, let me repeat some of the things that I said in my talk. Our system is based on self-monitoring and self-reporting. And we believe that by, um, uh, first of all, um, requiring an assurance of animal welfare with each uh, institution that receives funds from us, um, that, that is the first step in the way our office works. And um, the assurance is a document describing how the program is operated. and and how that program achieves compliance with the PHS policy, as you all know now, because I'm saying it for the third time, uh, because the policy uh, incorporates by reference the uh, standards of the guide. Um, the next way that we work with the institutions is through um, education and policy interpretation. That's the job of my division. Um, and we believe that through education, we prevent noncompliances from occurring. And noncompliances do occasionally occur, and those are reported by the institution or by outside parties um, or, or individuals within the organization. We accept reports of uh, reportable events from, from, from any place that they come. And then our... Uh, Compliance Division works with that organization to, first of all, uh, stop the non-compliant situation, uh, make sure that people and animals are safe, and then to put in uh, policies in place that prevent that situation from occurring again in the future. And when that occurs, then the case is closed. Um, and we believe that by educating everyone and involving everyone involved in the program, uh, the care staff, the uh, veterinarians, the principal investigators, all of these people under the um, oversight of the IACUC in providing uh, appropriate care for the animals, that we in fact have a system that is working 24 seven to ensure um, humane animal practices. So I would submit, this is my opinion now, that perhaps our system is more effective than an inspection system, which is generating a, a snapshot in time. We're trying to make sure that everyone is working toward a culture of humane care at all times. 
I just want to reiterate the value we place in the animal welfare compliance inspections, and that I believe, as Dr. Clark said, you are able to do something more for primates because the statutory language is there, which isn't there for other species. And, and instead of it just coming from the humane community, it would be nice if as a community together we might see about working on it. Thank you. Okay, just, just to um, keep us on track, and I, and I don't want to cut off the discussion, but we've only addressed about four questions in the last 30 minutes, and I see we got numerous people here, and, and um, we want to make sure that we break at lunch. So if we, we got 10 more minutes to try and get in the, as many questions as we can. Thank you. Donna Matthews Gerald from Mass General Hospital. I appreciate the examples that were shared this morning, and um, where uh, you have already worked with institutions to attempt uh, this new approach to emphasizing performance standards. And I'm interested in, after you've gone through the process of getting the uh, evidence-based performance standard vetted through your IACUC and, and presented in uh, whatever fashion, assurance or regulatory review, and at that point, each of you have mentioned ongoing assessment of that performance uh, standard. So I'd be interested in uh, seeing what those institutions have done after a performance standard has been evaluated as far as is it um, more consistent with exceptions to the guide approach where every six months it's, it's reviewed semi-annually, or is it uh, pretty much the institution is allowed to um, evaluate on a, on a schedule that they determine? Well, um, I'm going to take the example of the uh, laminar flow uh, hood and just, um, and of course, I'm going to have to have some help from my colleagues. Uh, actually, the two regional directors are here. We also have an inspector here. But from what I gather in that situation, um, they came to us. We took a look at it, um, and we approved it. There were no adverse effects. And of course, the Aya Cook, we leave it to the Aya Cook to constantly monitor that situation on an on a six-month basis. Um, and I guess situations like that are looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, and more or less the, the regular mechanisms that are in place in our regulations uh, continue to be at play. Um, does anybody from, the, from uh, USDA want to add anything to what I've said? OK. <laughs> We agree, too. We expect programs to be evaluated semi-annually, but we um, would defer to the IACUC to make the decision. It's their responsibility, and they have the authority to make the decision about the ongoing assessment. Diane Gertner, University of Pennsylvania. So I'd like to also say that you also have the additional monitoring in that, in that example where if you had complications of surgery and there was sepsis, you'd have the veterinarians and the veterinary technicians right there every day you know, looking at all the sick animals. And then they would certainly be reporting back to the IACUC if there was any doubt that sepsis was being maintained. So I'd like to speak for the veterinarians out there. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to comment on this. I mean, the question was obviously about the, the U.S. system. But um, we would expect that the Animal Welfare Ethical Review Body would be keeping the, the, the change under review. But we would also, and the point was just made there, we, we have a framework of individuals working within an establishment. And I think it's always that framework that people need to focus on. So the, the idea seems to be um, in, in the lay public's mind often that once you get a license to be able to carry out research, you've got individual scientists beavering away there doing their science, and nobody else is around them. And it's actually the strength of the framework of the individuals and the competency of those, those individuals. So if you've got really well qualified and trained animal care staff, and they are empowered to speak up, and I say that very importantly, because that's, that's a key part of it, that they don't just feel they're there, to clean, feed, and water, but they're there to also comment, and, and they can have a view, and they can speak up. We know that veterinarians are going to speak up, so therefore they are there as well. Even though we have an inspection system, which is a national inspection system with inspectors going regularly 
to visit establishments, and we call those visits rather than inspections because they are visits, although there's an inspection component to that. But even though we have that, we still rely an enormous amount on the framework within the establishment, and we're monitoring the performance of that framework. And that's much more important, I think, than, than having a draconian inspection system. I appreciate that. I was looking that it would be up to the institution to do this in a finite period of time and not have an ongoing uh, uh, report to present to the regulators. That was my interest, so thank you. Steve Neamey, Harvard University. I have a question for Carol. Uh, I was intrigued about your metaphor of the unicorn versus the narwhal. Both have very sharp pointed instruments that could do a lot of damage uh, if used in the wrong manner. Uh, but I'm intrigued about the uh, allowances and the flexibility uh, that you described. And I'd had uh, experience with another one at an institution I won't name, but we had in pair housing very common species of, of primates who were more vertically oriented than horizontally. And our inspector allowed for a vertically uh, increased cage size rather than following the letter of the engineering standards that were in the Animal Welfare Act. When I asked this inspector about written documentation for that opinion, uh, there was great reluctance. And thankfully, I had a voicemail recorded on my phone that I could share with our IACUC and use every six months to continue that, uh, uh, that, that particular exemption. So the question I have is, as you are or are becoming more flexible, uh, how can we find out what flexibility has been decided on an ad hoc basis, and we, I mean the public, uh, so that those interpretations may be applicable in possibly similar circumstances? I get, to me, um, A, what is, what's in the literature, B, um, what works. You know, if, uh, it, let's say, um, in innovative housing, that we find that you've, you've done this, we're not seeing any adverse effects of the animals. Um, this is a situation where we may approve it, but this is also a situation where we would encourage the, the facility to publish on it, to kind of get that information out to other facilities that this type of housing works. And that way it finds its way into the mainstream. But certainly with us, we look at these things on a case-by-case -case basis, and if you can show the inspector that there are no adverse effects and, and we're trying to achieve a particular outcome, um, you know, the inspector should approve it, but if there's an issue, you can always go through our appeals process um, and discuss it that way. But we, I, I'm speaking my own opinion. We don't stand in the way of progress. So we know things change and evolve. We know situations come up. We know facilities differ. So we're, we're willing to work with you. And that's greatly appreciated. How, how are those interpretations or conclusions shared within USDA that could then be shared amongst all the inspectors and again with the public so that the rest of us aren't dependent upon that institution to disclose that they've been given some allowance or some latitude because they may not be willing to do that either in order to call more attention to themselves. So that's more of a rhetorical question, but uh, I'm supposed to speak tomorrow on sharing uh, performance standards, and uh, this will certainly go on the list, that as the government side of the House uh, provides more um, flexibility when it's appropriate and in the interest of animal welfare, how can those accommodations uh, be publicized? I'll have my comment, and then hopefully the regional directors will jump in, but um, Last summer, we had a, a meeting of uh, research facility VMOs, and that's where we hashed out a lot of different things, and it's my hope that there'll be more meetings like that. Plus, there's a lot of discussion. We have groups that do meet and discuss and share information. Um, do the regional directors or our VMO have anything to add? Golden Tire with USDA. I would just say that um, when, since we are, you know, the regulatory part, the piece of all this with the enforcement hammer, 
when we start issuing directives and things that, that spread this information out, you know, there's a lot of public interest and it's just that I think it's really easier for us if it comes from you all. If it's a practice standard, it's way easier for us to incorporate that than for the regulatory agency to, to you know, start issuing guidelines because then they become expectations and regulations. All right, we have time. We'll do one, one more question. You've been waiting a long time. We'll just keep it really brief and the answer is brief if we could. My name is Buddy Capuano uh, from the Wisconsin National Primate Research Center. And I'd like to talk about compiling performance standards. Um, we have 194 SOPs at the Primate Center. We um, are at a larger institution that has a plethora of uh, animal care policies. We have policies that are approved through the IACUC. And then on top of that, we have personnel, we have veterinarians, we have husbandry staff, we have PIs who have decades of experience with non-human primates. My performance standards don't live in one place. They're not compiled in one place. So when you come to visit me, and when I tell you that some of my uh, performance standards are in my head or in the heads of everyone who works at the primate center, how do you respond? How does USDA respond? How does OLAW respond to the fact that my performance standards are, you know, just everywhere? We would allow, we would um, say that that is up to the IACUC to determine um, how they want to oversee this. USDA, we're the inspector comes and if they take a look and say, okay, why are these animals not housed according to the housing chart? We're looking for an answer. And if the answer is logical and you say, well, we do it like this and you have documentation and there are no adverse effects, there shouldn't be a problem. Okay. I guess I'm trying to get at a bigger question is uh, uh, what is your, um, belief, what, 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 is, what is your desire to, to see these performance standards? The whole panel, I mean, do you expect them to, oh, here's our website, here's our performance standards, or do you, is it okay that they're, they're in a lot of places? One of the things that we did to try and encourage people to sort of share their best practices is, as I, as I said before, we're, we're fortunate in having this three hours microsite, which means that we can post and, and publish information that's not necessarily in guidelines documents, that's not necessarily in the published literature. But uh, we worked with institutions to encourage them to let us post their standard operating procedures up there. And it was really so that we could facilitate that sharing across the country so people who had um, a good idea or a good way, a good practice um, could post it and, and uh, facilitate um, practices being shared across the country. Uh, but I think unless, you know, unless we get information out there and are willing to share it in the, in the public arena, um, then, you know, it's always going to sort of stay, stay within the, the facility and uh, people may not have had the opportunity to see it and experience it and to understand how it can work in practice. All right, I'm gonna I, have to cut off yeah. if I, that's okay. I, can we, will we yeah, continue wanted... this over lunch? <laughs> no. All right, go ahead, Susan. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> presumably, your performance standards are not in conflict with your SOPs. If there's, uh, you know, your program is to be reviewed semi-annually, and so if you have this uh, plethora, was your word, of performance standards, there should be some connection between these standards and your SOPs. And I... Um, need to add a, a, an, a quick appendix to my answer to Kathy List's very challenging question. And I want to say that our division of uh, compliance does make site visits uh, to facilities uh, to conduct uh, an examination of the programs when those are warranted. OK. With that, we will break for lunch. I want to thank the morning speakers um, for their time. And we will try to, um, we'll, we'll, 
probably start right at five after one. We'll go the whole hour. We'll just plan to start right back at five after one. Thank you. <laughs>